Okay. If everyone could take their seats, please. All right. Can everyone hear me? All right. Well, so good afternoon and welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today for the installation of Professor Jeremy Goldbach as the Masters and Johnson Distinguished Professor in Sexual Health and Education. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Beverly Windland, and I am Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at Washington University. And I am deeply grateful to be able to gather in person with all of you here today as we recognize Jeremy Goldbach. I also want to say hello. Do we have some remote people um, who are here? So I want to say hello to our remote Zoom people and um, welcome you virtually to our event. And we wish you could be here with us. OK, so we are here today for an endowed professorship installation. And endowed professorships are among the highest honors that Washington University can, in, can bestow upon a faculty member. This reflects our deep appreciation for the profound contributions the recipient has made to Washington University, to their field of research, and to society. Jeremy is a part of a large community of individuals at Washington University and the Brown School who hold endowed professorships and other positions recognizing their extensive work in their field of study. With today's installation, we recognize Jeremy's important work in the field of sexual health and education as a member of the Brown School faculty and throughout his career. As we begin today, I would like to welcome our many guests who join us today from the campus and friends and family of Professor Jeremy Goldbach who are here today. So please help me in giving a warm welcome to Jeremy's family. So his husband, Evan, and their children, Hollis and Elias. So would you please stand and be recognized? Yep. <laughs> yes, welcome. <laughs> And we have um, Jeremy's mother and in-laws are here. So where are they? Oh, they're streaming. OK, well, hello, welcome. <laughs> Glad to have you here virtually. Um, and Professor Goldbach is also joined today by many of his university colleagues, family and friends, both in person and others that are celebrating along with us virtually today. I'm also grateful to see many familiar faces in the audience from our Brown School National Council who are great supporters for all of us. So to celebrate today's installation of the Masters and Johnson Distinguished Professor in Sexual Health and, and Education, I am honored to be joined by Washington University Chancellor Andrew D. Martin. Um, we are supposed to have Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs Anna Gonzalez. I think she must be running late. Um, and we have our interim co-deans of the Brown School, Tanya Edmond and Rodrigo Reyes. So very pleased to have these distinguished um, fellow administrators here with me today. So the research, advocacy, and academic ende endeavors at the Brown School and Washington University have had an impactful history of advancing positive change in St. Louis, across the nation, and throughout the world. This distinguished professorship recognizes an important part of that history, the research and work of Dr. William Masters and Virginia Johnson at Washington University. Their legacy lives on through this professorship and the continued academic focus on sexual health and education at the Brown School. The Brown School has the only specialization of this kind within a Masters of Social Work program, and it has become one of the most popular offerings, preparing our students for careers as sexuality educators, advocates, policymakers, program administrators and therapists, and for critical and holistic social work practice that recognizes the links between sexuality and social and health disparities. We are so proud to have this work at the Brown School and at the university. So I would now like to invite the chair of the Sexual Health and Education Specialization, Dr. Susan Stieritz, to join me on the stage to share a few remarks about sexual health education at Washington University. Susan? Thank you for all your support of our program. We really appreciate it. So my pronouns are she, her, hers. 
Um, and I'm glad that I've been invited to say a few words. I appreciate the opportunity to contextualize Jeremy Goldback's appointment and comment on its enormous significance. I'm sure I speak for most of you when I express great alarm over escalating conflicts created by disparate sex, gender, and racial values, norms, laws, and cultures in this country. Ignorance over what is scientific fact and what is social construction seems to be part of the problem, narrowing access to human rights. Abortion, sex education, clinical sexual health services, classroom lessons, novels, and other books discussing sex sexual diversity, and bathrooms are part of the collateral damage. So are the lives of many. Suicide is the second largest cause of death of children, adolescents, and young people. People in a sensitive per period of sexual unfolding. People particularly vulnerable to minority stress, which makes them feel unwanted and burdensome. So here's where Jeremy Goldback comes in. He has spent the last decade or more developing positive, scientifically validated antidotes to heterosexist myths that undermine good sex for everyone and spoil our sexual culture. Jeremy, do I, is it okay if I call you Jeremy, Professor? Jeremy's research and intervention, proud and empowered, builds on the strength of love rather than on the strategies outrage fosters. As a person who chooses collaboration over confrontation, his intervention is creating more illumination than heat. His intervention demonstrates how young people can connect with each other better by ignoring straight gay binaries that disconnect them. If I'm reading Jeremy's work correctly, his LGBT teen participants process minority stress that has diminished them as they learn to create and implement Everyone Wins collaborative, experiential sex education and social justice training for their straight as well as LGBT peers. Jeremy's participants go through a 10-week training session, then pledge to offer similar interventions of their own design in their schools, churches, and other organizations. When they share with their peers the, the, their versions of the best sex, gender education, and affirming um, experiences available in this country, an amazing transformation takes place. Because their untutored peers have been yearning for this kind, this real sex education, rather than the adultist, fear-based, controlling sex education they have been getting, their heterosexist skepticism wanes and profound gratitude and admiration develop for their LGBT peers and their allies. The revisionary knowledge and skills the peer educators share with them become a basis for new solidarity. Jeremy's faith that young people want to get along, want to become effective change agents, and want to make the world a better place is getting results. Well, this is a long introduction to explain this afternoon marks a lost le legacy, legacy at Washington University, refound. That of critical sex research and pleasure restoring therapy, which Masters and Johnson introduced during the 1950s and 1960s here at Washington University. Jeremy and his team's work, like Masters and Johnson's, exposes and corrects false assumptions about best practices in good sex. Uh, Jeremy's initiated a paradigm, Masters and Johnson initiated a paradigm change in our sexual culture, and I think Jeremy is doing the same, along with others in the field who have been working on this for 50 years. Masters and Johnson's research, among other things, busted Freud's early 20th century heterosexist myth that the vaginal orgasm, not clitoral pleasure, constituted mature, healthy female sexuality. While Masters and Johnson depathologized women's pleasure, uh, Jeremy and his team depathologized same-sex lovers' pleasure and relationships. He and his colleagues in the field make clear that consensual LGBT sex is every bit as normal and healthy as consensual, sec, uh, consensual straight sex. That, heter that heterosexism is an oppressive regime, not an innocent sexual preference. This perspective can go a long way toward eliminating the homonegativity 
that harms people. My colleague from the School of Law, Susan Appleton, and I have been working since 2009, 23 years, is that right? I think so, to restore Masters and Johnson's legacy loss to Washington University in the 1980s. Um, their names are not even in our university's history books at this point. I'm sure they'll be coming back into favor, though. Masters and Johnson's legacy centers sex positivity, scientific exploration, social justice, and courageous intervention. With the university's creation of this Masters and Johnson distinguished professorship, and with the Brown School se selection of such an appropriate professor to inaugurate it, I feel optimistic Washington University will once again take its rightful place in the expansion of social justice through transformative sex research and transformative sex education. Jeremy has come up with an appropriate acronym for those of us working on this project together at the Brown School. SURGE, SURGE, S-E-R-G. We are the sexuality education, wait a minute, sexuality education and research group. Yes, and research group, an arm of our school's pursuit of social justice. <laughs> I'm always hard, have a hard time with acronyms. So, <laughs> um, now is the time to thank you, Chancellor Martin, uh, our former provost, Holden Thor, our current provost, Beverly Winlam, our former deans, Mary McKay and Eddie Lawler, our co-deans, Edmund and Reese, faculty and students of the Specialization in Sexual Health and Education, Sexual Education and Research Group members, members of the Brown School's Alliance for Sexuality and Reproductive Freedom, and today, especially you, Jeremy, who, who have come here to help heteronormativity get over itself, and to affirm all young people's entitlement to pride and empowerment, especially to sexual pride and empowerment. Um, you all make palpable commitment to the truth that there is no sexual health without social justice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan, for your powerful, social justice-focused, uh, sex-positive commentary um, and a reminder about the legacy and importance of Masters and Johnson at Washington University. It is now my distinct pleasure to recognize Professor Jeremy Goldbach. Professor Goldbach has an outstanding record of scholarship and a passion for his research involving the relationship between minority stress in marginalized populations and behavioral health outcomes. I was so pleased when, we accepted the, when he accepted the opportunity to join us last fall at the Brown School. Professor Goldbach moved with his family from California to Missouri, and they have quickly become an integral part of our St. Louis and Brown School communities. Professor Goldbach earned his master's and doctoral degrees in social work from the University of Texas at Austin, which is where I also received my master's and PhD, so hook em horns. <laughs> and then he began his academic journey as an assistant professor at the University of Southern California School of Social Work. He spent almost a decade at USC where he conducted extensive research funded by the National Institutes of Child Health and Human Development, the National Institute of Minority Health Disparities, the Department of Defense, and many other federal um, sources. He did all of this while also serving as the director of the USC LGBT Health Equity Initiative. Recently, Professor Goldbach received a five-year grant from the National Institute of Health for a project titled Efficacy of a Multi-Level Intervention for LGBTQ uh, Youth. This is the first NIH-funded intervention study to address making schools safer for LGBTQ plus youth through policy change and universal education. Professor Goldbach's work also draws an important tie across the three major disciplines at the Brown School as the impact of his worth with LGBTQ plus youth crosses social work, public health, and social policy. 
These qualities and achievements make him an exceptional fit for this professorship, this professorship. And since joining us, he has already impacted the community here tremendously with both his professional and personal commitments. I am thrilled to have come to know Professor Goldbach and am proud to count him as, a, as my Was Washington University and Brown School colleague. But I also want to say, as a member of the LGBTQ community, I am deeply grateful for his critically important work. So thank you, Jeremy, for being here, being part of our community, and doing work that has the potential to have such a profound impact on the trajectory of young queer people's lives. I am deeply, deeply appreciative. At this time, I have the pleasure of inviting our Chancellor, uh, Chancellor Martin and Professor Goldbach to come forward and proceed with the installation. Jeremy T. Goldbach, I officially name you the Masters and Johnson Distinguished Professor in Sexual Health and Education. Jeremy, I would, I'm honored to present this medallion to you. On the front, it reads the Masters and Johnson Distinguished Professorship in Sexual Health and Education. And on the back, Jeremy T. Goldbach, May 11, 2022. Congratulations. <laughs> it is now my sincere pleasure to introduce Jeremy Goldbach, the Masters and Johnson Distinguished Professor in Sexual Health and Education who will present his chair address, Let's Talk About Sex Because the Silence is Killing Me. Jeremy, congratulations. Hi. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you, Susan. That was beautiful. Thank you, Tanya, and everyone who's been here. I, I feel like I have to start by thanking so many of the people who have supported me getting to this stage. My family, who saw me through grad school, even though they still aren't allowed to be my first patient. My husband, who gave up so much of his own career to follow my work and because he said, you love your job and I can't be the one to take that from you. My kids, who remind me daily to stop taking my job so seriously because as they say, I'm not the kind of doctor that actually saves people's lives. <laughs> the school leadership here who welcomed me into the community and so many of the faculty from Mary, Tanya, Rodrigo, Susan, Siamari, and others who have graciously given their time to me as I've tried to transition here. The wa and, uh, to WashU, Provost and Chancellor for coming today and taking the time to get to know me a little bit better. And finally, thank you to everyone who came today here in person and virtually. It's really so amazing to be back in person and seeing people in real life again and having the opportunity to share these kinds of moments together. So I know you all came to hear about my past work and vision for my research, which over the past decade has primarily focused on LGBTQ or queer, for short, children and adolescents. But as I was thinking about the platform that you've just given me and the fact that you already gave me this medal so you can't take it away, <laughs> and how best to use this time, I decided in the end that I wanted to take a slightly different direction. Because, well, I, I need to keep my eight-year-old engaged and they haven't covered longitudinal growth curve modeling in her class yet. <laughs> right, Owen? <laughs> and I have you all captive and the doors are locked. They're probably not locked. That would probably be a problem. Um, but to be honest, you know, I, I kept reflecting on you know, the work that I have done and not just the work that I did or want to do moving forward when I am here at WashU, but rather why 
I'm doing this work. What my actual goals are for the future and how we're gonna fix health disparities for queer young people. And why I think that every single one of us, and in particular today, every single one of you, need to start talking about sex in a variety of contexts starting today. I also considered this alternative title to try and boost likes on YouTube and Instagram, but it's already been claimed, so apologies for my less catchy title. But I'm gonna begin by bringing us back to the 90s. In 1999, can anyone remember how much gas cost? Guesses? Yeah, like a dollar, right? A dollar 22 a gallon. The Macarena was so popular that even Colin uh, Powell was showing off his moves for the world to see. <laughs> And to get on the internet, we had to pay by the minute and couldn't even use our phones at the same time. Get off the phone, you remember this. <laughs> by 1994, millions of us had pagers to communicate with and we were creating secret little codes like 43770 to try and say hello to people. Little did we know what was to come <laughs> in terms of texting. And what most of us remember best at this time were the people and the way that those people were shared with us through the media. So you had the preps with their stylish clothes and tight haircuts and connected networks. As Urban Dictionary defines, the preps were the wealthy class of teens often cruelly capitalizing on their superior access to social power, including a system of dress and demeanor much akin to their fraternity and sorority counterparts, ultimately to mature into the country club community. Ouch. You also had the grunge kids. When you look them up on Urban Dictionary, you find angst-filled, angry, frustrated, sad, and fearsome youth with a strong preference for obscure indie bands until they sign with a label, and an intense striving for apathy and underachievement. So these are the kids that I remember and, you know, and of course there was me, this handsome, strapping, <laughs> dapper young lad. Oh wait, sorry, that's actually Marlon Brando, but we can look at this for a second. I feel like, this is nice. You too, husband. No, but then there was me. This strapping young, I mean awkward, self-conscious, confused young kid trying to figure out my place. And as a young gay kid at this time in my life, I knew that something was different about me, but I didn't even really have the words at the time to make sense of it. Because this notion of sexuality is really complicated. I mean, what does it even mean, really, to be gay or lesbian or queer? Now that I'm older and I've spent a lot more time thinking about this, I know that sexuality and gender and gender identity are really complex and they're independent, but they also intersect and interact and help us make sense of the world around us and who we are and where we fit. Sexual identity, for example, is made up of all of these factors, like who we're attracted to, who we engage in relationships with, both romantic and sexual or not, how we identify. This was really confusing to me as a kid because you know, while the invention of the bromance was a really nice way of allowing us to express maybe some level of attraction to other men through close friendships, behaviors and identities outside of the dominant heteronorm were definitely not allowed. Then when we add gender to this mix, it makes for an even broader spectrum of identities and perspectives and interactions with the built environment that I, for one, did not feel was built for me. And just to remind everyone, we were still in the land of pay-by-the-minute internet. So we just had to kind of submit to the notion that information was just too hard to get. So we may as well just stop trying and focus on the things that really mattered, like going to the mall. <laughs> because at the mall, you could do almost anything. You could get your ears pierced at Claire's, Sometimes without your parents knowing. Well, then they found out later. 
You could buy Manic Panic hair dye at Hot Topic, also without your parents knowing. You could go to those massage chairs at Sharper Image. You could buy those really weird tasting creamsicle smoothies at Orange Julius. There was something for everyone at the mall. But for me, it was really Sam Goody that I poured myself into because music was where I always found myself in the words to push boundaries that I didn't even really understand existed. Now to be fair, at the time, I didn't really appreciate the long-standing relationship that music has to controversy. From the social, justice, social and racial justice movement of the 1930s, when Billie Holiday was protesting lynching in Strange Fruit, to Madonna being protested by the Vatican and Boy George's fluid gender presentation that my parents consistently told me was what happens when you do too many drugs. But at this particular time in history, it was all about salt and pepper and their new single, Let's Talk About Sex. And I had heard about this song from my friends at school who were singing it quietly in the halls. And the speed with which they would cut off their singing when a teacher walked by let me know that there was something about this song that needed to be kept very quiet. Which also let me know that it was something that I absolutely needed in my life. Even though I hadn't even really heard more than snippets. So on this one day in history, I remember consigning myself to purchasing the single at the store. I remember it like it was yesterday. I picked up the cassette, yes, cassette, walked through the store to the counter. I knew that this album had that mature audience's rating on it, so I knew that I had to act real cool and have a very short interaction because the difference between have a good day and are your parents here to approve this purchase could be dramatic. Thinking fast, I also grabbed a Gordon Lightfoot tape to help ensure that they would see me as a very sophisticated and definitely old enough to buy this tape age. <laughs> Palms sweaty, I approach, good afternoon, it seems very adult, and scan and pay and score and straight home to listen to my favorite Gordon Lightfoot album. <laughs> Just kidding. To listen to the song that everyone had been talking about so constantly. Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about you and me. And then the lines, let's talk about sex for now. To the people at home or in the crowd, it keeps coming up anyhow. Don't be coy, avoid or make void the topic because that ain't gonna stop it. And suddenly, I had so many questions about sex. But the only question that I remember at the time hearing was that of my parents behind me yelling, how did you get that tape? <laughs> and to lecture me on the inappropriate nature of this music, and that these weren't things that I should be listening to or hearing. And no matter how many times Salt and Pepper told me that we should talk about sex, this is one of the earliest memories that I have that we should absolutely not be talking about sex. So I learned, like many of us in this room, straight, gay, trans, otherwise, that talking about sex and sexuality was taboo, was wrong, was inappropriate, was outside, and outside of the very few hetero and cis norm experiences in school, should basically never really be discussed. And as an LGBTQ person, we knew that we really couldn't discuss this with our parents. Not only because of the messaging that we get from society in general, but also because when you're born to parents that are so different from you, most of the time, you're taught about what it means, you're taught about what it means to be who you are, or you aren't taught about who, who, who you are and what it means to be that person. And as Andrew Solomon says in his book, Far From the Tree, Perhaps the immutable error of parenthood is that we give our children what we want, whether they want it or not. We heal our wounds with the love that we wish we had received, but are often blind to the wounds that we inflict. So I didn't ask, and they certainly didn't tell. And it went on like that for a while. But of course, I was 12. And since sex is also, you know, like a completely natural and not particularly interesting thing, 
if we stopped giving it so much power. It also meant that we had to find alternative ways of learning about sex and sexuality. Like from TV shows, generally placing men and women in really clear binary roles and positions of dominance and submission, of chaser and chaste, and of romantic dates that because this, room, this movie has to wrap up in 90 minutes, end in sex almost 100% of the time. Or just a really strange kiss with an oddly long close-up and the insinuation of what happens next. It also meant that we had to learn from pornography, which is both often both exploitive and fantastical, rarely matching the reality that many people have. Plus, we all know what porn does. But in seriousness, it's not just LGBTQ people that are taught that sexuality and talking about their experiences of sexuality are inappropriate. The way that sexuality is stigmatized, how we use it to add a mask of disgrace in certain circumstances, experiences, qualities of individual, has led us to a place where the silence around sexuality is so immense that exploitation happens all the time and nobody ever knows. For example, even though more than 70 years ago, Williams, William Masters and Virginia Johnson brought science into the bedroom to look at sex and research for any reason other than medical or reproductive purpose, we still kind of think about their work as vanguard. They just made a series about them. Even today, and even though it was more than 40 years ago that Dennis Daly introduced us to these circles of sexuality with more than 25 components, we still find ourselves only openly able to openly discuss a small fraction of these components like body image maybe, the media, love, reproductive systems, biosex, uh, sex assigned at birth, gender roles. And yeah, we've made some modest progress in discussing these components of sex and sexuality in public spaces and are working to address their impact. But there are so many aspects that we know almost nothing about. Or worse, those with such intense shame, guilt, and stigma associated with them to the point where our, even our most marginalized victims begin to ask themselves, what is wrong with me? And this push towards silence has rippling effects in how we live in every aspect of our lives. For example, if consent starts with a conversation and we're never taught how to speak or taught to feel shame when we do speak, then what does that mean for my ability to negotiate consent? Or a salary at a new company? And if talking about sexuality and gender is hard when you're part of the dominant culture, where does that leave those of us who don't match the expectations that have been being placed on us since the day that we were born? Well, for LGBTQ people, the messages from general population about our sexuality and our gender identities is quite clear. We need only look back a few weeks to see the can't say gay bills passing state governments and bills that would classify providing gender-affirming care to one's trans child as reportable abuse in Texas and Idaho. Or pull up to our local Boy Scout meeting and see where they're saying about us there. And when you aren't allowed to speak about sexuality as a queer person, there are a lot of unanswered questions that still remain silent. Like, is there something wrong with me? Here's a really nice quote from the APA on why we can't be fixed because we're not trying hard enough. And can I pray it away? The answer is no, just to be clear. And are they right about me? And will I die this way? Do I deserve to? When there is silence, there are thoughts that run through our heads. And with really very few people in the public eye, trying to counter that narrative over the years, and let's not forget what happened to Laura Dunn after this episode. It's hard not to feel like there is a target painted on your back, even when all we really want to do is fit in. So we internalize these experiences, and this turns into the health disparities that we see. 
So when we think about homelessness, we know that about 1% of, uh, in the U.S., 1% of people will experience homelessness. About 1% will be involved in the child welfare system. About a half a percent will uh, contract HIV or seroconvert. 8% will be diagnosed with a substance use disorder. A little more than 8% will make a suicide attempt. Well, when we look within these populations, we see huge disproportionate impact on LGBTQ people. 38% of homeless folks, we represent less than 10%, right, of the U.S. population. 38% of homelessness, homeless people are LGBT. More than half of those with HIV, diagnosed with HIV. A third of our child welfare system. 16% of those in substance use and 30% of all those that make a suicide attempt. Now let me show you within these disparity populations, or I'm sorry, so queer people are left to their thoughts and this isolation and loneliness drives depression and substance use and anxiety and ultimately for many folks to con consider or die by suicide. For me personally, this led to addiction, anxiety, and ultimately dropping out of high school. But fast forward 20 years, and sometimes it feels like some things haven't actually really changed that much. But I don't want you to just take my word for it, so I'll let uh, some of the young people who we've spoken to over the last 10 years uh, in our recent research looking at suicide speak for themselves to help kind of contextualize why uh, rates of suicide uh, are four to ten times higher in, in uh, LGB folks to their cis peers and why 41% of trans folks report making a suicide attempt in their life. So this young person said, and then for some reason in my head I thought people would totally know. As soon as they look at you, they're like, you're different from everyone else. And I was really uncomfortable with that. I was uncomfortable with myself. Another young person said, the majority, well, a lot of people are getting, becoming more accepting, but then there's the others. The others who think you're disgusting, who hurt you because you're gay, who shun you because you're gay. You know, that's why I'm afraid. I mean, I don't want to be isolated. It's just, we don't really talk about it. It's quiet. I guess since we hold it all in, and that's just how it's been. I'm not 100% sure even now, even when I'm with them, I don't feel like I'm part of the group. I always feel like I'm looking into the group, but not within the group. And at times, you know, before I would get sad, but now I've just accepted it. And yeah, it was a pretty low point in my life because I didn't have anyone to go to. Nobody checked up on me. Nobody asked how I was. Nobody seemed to be concerned with how I was feeling. Just nothing. And our other research on stress suggests even in large community samples, large national samples, no less than 30% report social marginalization, living in home and negative climates. Nearly 80% of our young people report family rejection. And if you're wondering why this matters, well, the connection to suicide in particular is clear. Whether we look at victimization or family rejection, homonegative communication, disclosure experiences, we see increased risk of suicide attempt. So while their deaths may be suicide, I want to be really clear with you, it's not suicide that's killing our youth. Homophobia and trans negativity are what's killing our youth. Silence is what's killing our youth. And we all have to play a role in breaking this silence and finding some sort of meaningful connection, like this really cute cat that I found <laughs> in the background of this Google image. <laughs> but seriously, I have to implore you, don't just come to this talk today, feel bad, post on Facebook, and hope for the best. Don't just tell your friends on Instagram that you came so that they know what a great person that you are. Because the consequences of your inaction are really serious. And ally is a verb, not a noun. 
And since I have this platform right now, and you've already given me this thing, I have some advice for all of my allies in the room. First, are your pronouns in your email signature? What about your Zoom? If you're wondering why this really matters, I am here to tell you it absolutely does. Are there other queer folks in the room? Does it matter? Do you notice when people have their pronouns in their Zoom name? Yes. Yes. It matters. We see it. It's a way of breaking silence. It's a way of letting us know that you're there. You don't have to know everything about being LGBT. You just have to be a safe space. You have to be a harbor. It tells us, I see you. I know you exist. What about your syllabi? As instructors, we love more than anything to make this joke. Check the syllabus. Now, the Brown School has an official policy on including language around pronouns and syllabi. Great work. But I have a few friends here from the university, to the provost and chancellor, I hope you'll think and look closely at making this a university-wide policy. <laughs> Have you been through safe space training? The Brown School has all faculty go through safe space training. Many other schools in our university do as well. I'd love to see this become universal. You can find it for free. There are many folks at the Brown School who are happy to do this for you. Can we make this universal in our commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion, which is both in our school plan and our university one? How about equal access to university-wide university -wide to restrooms so that every building in this school, in this university, has a place where people can do their biological functions. Even if you feel comfortable in a binary restrooms, these signs send a message, set a tone, and change the norms and break the silence. Yes, it may take a little bit of work to get some of these amazing historic buildings in order, but this is one of the best universities in the entire world. Are we really willing to say that we can't figure out how to change a sign or retrofit some spaces? I agree that its history is that history is what brought us to this problem. We just may differ on whether we interpret that history as a good thing or a bad one. How many of you in this room engage in research? I implore you, if you don't do LGBT research, take a look at your study variables. Do you include comprehensive measures of sexual and gender identity in your studies? We ask about lots of demographics now, including highly invasive questions around poverty and socioeconomics and access to free lunches and intense questions about people's racial and ethnic identities. And yet, still I see every day the lack of attention to LGBTQ identities because it's not really relevant to our study, or it just feels too sensitive to ask. But let me tell you directly, not only does not asking about these identities render people's experiences invisible, it's also honestly kind of bad science, because our epi data shows us very clearly that these communities are at heightened risk for a ton of behavioral health outcomes, as I've shown already. So if our studies are not accounting for that as a critical uh, covariate, we may be missing the boat on what's actually going on for our research participants. And it's not just me that says this. The National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine agree, and they've recently con uh, created consensus reports to help guide us on best practices. So my point is, yes, changing school, city, county, state-level policy is really important. And I hope all of you will support these efforts, too. But changing social norms also starts with individuals in this organization and those of you right here in this very room and on Zoom. 
And let me tell you, I've seen what just a simple conversation from a single supportive other can do to change the trajectory of LGBTQ youth lives. Like those who have spoken to us from the Trevor Project after they had uh, called uh, a crisis the, for crisis support after considering suicide. I'll let them speak for themselves. I'm still here. I'm not sure exactly what would have happened if I hadn't called. They helped me by telling me that I have value and I am not worthless. It helped me by being able to know that other people are understanding of my issue, that I'm not alone, even when I feel like I am. And I was able to calm down and think through my problems individually and feel safer in my own skin for a while. I stopped and I looked at my choices and I was able to cross suicide off my list of answers. So we know that there is hope. And if you take just one thing from today, please remember that all of us play a role in breaking the silence that we all carry, that we were born into around sex and sexuality and gender and identity and all of these things that are not shameful, but are beautiful and make us all unique. Because it's not even really about being lesbian or gay or trans or gender diverse, it's not really working for any of us. So in the wise words of salt and pepper, let's talk about sex, baby. <laughs> let's talk about you and me. Let's talk about all the good things and the bad things that may be. Let's talk about sex. But please, seriously, Go out there and talk about sex. Because the silence, it is literally killing us. And let's be honest, can you really say no to such a handsome young man? <laughs> so, I want to thank you again for your time and this opportunity. To my study team that now spans multiple universities, thank you for continuing to push my thinking beyond my comfort zone every time helping me to never get too comfortable or confident in my own ideas. To the thousands of yous who have participated in our studies over the years, thank you for your constant reminders that I have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about, but also your patience to show me a better way forward. I hope sincerely that you're starting to see the benefits of the time you've given to me in your own life and in the lives of the young people who are still to come. Finally, to my family and friends who are here, and those who could not be here today. I love you, I'm standing here because of you, and I hope I made you proud. Thank you. Well, don't you worry, I don't have to say much. I just have to make my closing <laughs> remarks. So, and Jeremy, thank you so much for not no, remaining silent. You are, really, you are really not only saving lives, but you are elevating the school to a new level, and we are very grateful for you here. So I thank you all for coming for this uh, ceremony. Uh, thank you for all of those that are now seeing this somewhere in the globe, and I wish you all have a lovely uh, evening. Thank you so much for coming today.